you know, even if you're just struggling with a decision and it's not like worrying about it every day, but you're really feeling indecisive about it and you just want to talk it out, that's a good time to seek help. Or if you're finding that your grief response feels too big for you and that you just need to talk about your losses, that's a good time to seek help. It doesn't have to be until when you meet the diagnostic criteria for a mental health disorder to seek help. You're listening to Becoming Wildly Resilient, brought to you by University of Kentucky Human Resources, Health and Wellness. In this series, we'll explore a variety of well-being topics with experts from the university community in physical, emotional, nutritional, and financial health. Join us, and together we'll discover how we can thrive at work, home, and beyond. Hello there, listener. So glad you're joining me for another episode of Becoming Wildly Resilient. I'm your host, Jacob Hester. That voice you heard at the beginning belongs to my colleague, Kim Relliford. Kim is a licensed clinical social worker and mental health therapist with UKHR Health and Wellness. In this episode, we focus our conversation on two of the most common mental health conditions, anxiety and depression. You'll hear us discuss what anxiety and depression are and how they are related, what the signs and symptoms are of each, and how we can recognize them in ourselves, why the stigma is lessening but still persists, and when to seek professional help and what you can expect when you do. Kim also shares tips for managing anxiety and depression, plus how we can support mental health in the workplace, regardless of whether or not you are experiencing a mental health condition. Be sure to listen through the end of the episode and check the show notes, because we highlight several important resources related to mental health. Finally, before you get into our conversation, this is also a quick reminder to hit the follow button wherever you're listening so that you don't miss any future episodes. And don't forget that you can reach out with any feedback or suggestions for future guests or topics by emailing us at healthandwellness at uky.edu. And now, here's my conversation with Kim Relliford. Welcome, Ken. So glad to have you part of our team and now on the show. Thank you. Can you start by telling the listeners a little bit about yourself personally, the things that make you, you? Oh, I would say there are many things that make me, me after all of these years, but um, not only do I think of it as personal, but also professionally, but I think of myself as a social worker, not as a career, but as a vocation. And so throughout my life, social justice issues have been very important to me. It's been part of my faith. It's been part of the way I was raised and it continues to be the way I live my life today. So I think that's probably what makes me me more than anything else. That's cool. That's a that's a nice summation to kind of see the blending between work and life as well. Um, that it's not just an occupation. It's not just a paycheck to you. It's something you kind of live by too. Um, so it's always cool to hear that. So I also have a fun kind of like quick getting to know you segment that I've added into each episode as well, where I pull a random question from a deck of conversation starters and we both answer it. So neither one of us know the question ahead of time. Okay. So here we go. Ooh, I like this one. If you could master one instrument, which would it be? I'd say the guitar, just because I think that it's such it's used so much in a lot of different types of music. And so I love all sorts of kinds of music. So I think that would be the one I would want to learn to play and to master. I think mine would be piano. If I could like learn how to play the keys. I think that like I've dabbled in quite a few instruments. I've talked about it in a couple of different episodes as well about some of the random instruments that I have. Um, that's one that I don't have and I don't really know how to play. I have like a very like vague working understanding of it, but th- I think that would be the one that I think I would love to master. Um, just again, sort of kind of like you mentioned for its versatility um, and playing like anything from, you know, classical music to modern music too. So um, I think that that's where mine would be, would be the the piano or the keyboard. So what about you professionally? What areas of mental health do you specialize in or enjoy working with the most? Um, I'd say I specialize in working with individuals with anxiety and depression, um, particularly those who've experienced trauma and grief and loss issues. And I find that many of those issues are actually co-occurring with substance use disorders. And that's the area that I've practiced most in throughout my career. That leads great into our conversation today about anxiety and depression. So obviously, that's the reason that I have you on here um, to talk about this topic. But you all, as therapists for HR, 
recently had the opportunity to go to Eastern Kentucky to support some of our employees and their families affected by the devastating flooding. Um, could you tell us just a little bit about that experience? Sure. Yeah, I, um, you had asked me this question in advance. So I had been thinking about it a little bit because I think that it was such a, um, in some ways, a visceral experience that it was hard to like really articulate what it was like, but I'm going to try. So the Work Life uh, Connections team had the privilege of going to Breathitt and Letcher County last week to meet with the UK Cooperative Extension employees who were impacted by the flood. And it's been about six weeks since the flood, and they've really worked tirelessly to help their communities meet you know, just their most basic of needs and um, and to connect with all of the different um, resources that they that are, are they're working with to begin to try to address all of the things that have happened to them because of the flood. Um, but, the, you know, our employees were also victims of the flood as well. So some of them lost their homes, their belongings. They witnessed the devastation of their communities. Um, one employee often spoke about like going up and just delivering food several days in a row, like multiple days, not like just one or two, but over a week's time to different people who were shut in or had limited access to coming down and getting where the resources were and just taking that food up to them and how important that was to her to try to give back to her community and to help the folks that are part of her, you know, part of her, not, you know, maybe she doesn't know them, but they are part of what makes up where she lives and her her area and her culture even. She talked a lot about that. Um, other um, employees talked a lot about having their offices as the emergency shelter and what that meant for their day-to-day -day operations. So not only did they have um, their own home life and family and extended families struggling with how the flood impacted them, but then they would come to work and work would also be everybody in a crisis. And so not being able to really kind of be, have that ability to step back, because oftentimes we use work to kind of escape something, you know, some of the stresses of home and home to escape some of the stresses of work. And that it was not an opportunity that they had. Um, so I think that was one of the things that really stuck with me was that whole idea that for the last six weeks, every aspect of their life has been about the flood. Um, so, you know, I think really, what I really enjoyed hearing about was the hope they have. And um, and I'm so proud of the work that they do each day. And I know I'm thankful for each one of them. And, you know, we're going back to not in Perry County to meet with the employees there. And so I just, you know, I think that our little part was just to go up and to offer the opportunity to talk about their experiences, to process that, and to really to reflect back on what has happened over the last six weeks and how that's impacted not only their life, but also their work. Yeah. The places you're going to coming up are like, my roots run very, very deep in there. My mom's you know, childhood home was like, at the crest in her neighborhood. It's like her house, I think the basement got flooded, but that was about it. They were very fortunate just to be a few feet over because the other people down the street weren't so lucky. Um, so that devastation was definitely felt. Um, and it's obviously nice for you all to get the opportunity to go down there to help our employees out, but the impact that that then has on the rest of the community as well. So while it feels like a small part that you're playing, um, the it kind of chain reactions down the line to um, and potentially helps all the other folks there that are impacted as well. So we're definitely appreciative um, that you were able to do that and be able to go down there and help and all that sort of thing. So especially after dealing with it on the other end of the state with tornadoes last year. So um, yeah, it's it's been a tough couple of years, but I know Kentuckians are pretty resilient um, and hopeful people. So, um, I know they'll, they'll continue to, to fight and work through it too. So, and then just knowing our employees around the state that we're here for you too. And I think that's particularly true of the Appalachian culture, because I think that that has been a lifetime of helping your neighbor and figuring things out. And because, you know, the roads are not always that great. They've only been really good in the last 20 years or so. They have really, they're not only survivors, they're thrivers up there. And I think that we have to give them a lot of credit because honestly, this is something that's going to impact them for decades, Yeah, decades. And sure. I think that, that that resiliency and that hope and that belief in community is what's going to take them through that. So, yeah. So I think this kind of leads us into our actual topic when we're, we're talking about mental health, because I mean, obviously something like a, you know, a big flood um, can really, you know, affect your mental health. 
um, but there's also a lot of day-to-day -day things. So we're going to kind of have a, a sort of a wide-reaching um, conversation, but I think we'll we'll narrow it in just a little bit um, to talk about a, a few specific conditions related to mental health. Uh, but just kind of generally, we know it's been such a major focus and topic of discussion recently over not just the past couple of years with the pandemic and you know the racial reckoning and all those things that have occurred in the last couple of years, um, but I think this was already sort of building up to that point anyways. Um, but we've seen, obviously, the effects of the last two and a half years, um, the recent implementation of that new 988 suicide and crisis lifeline. Um, and then September is actually also the um, National Suicide Prevention and Awareness Month. So I figured this will probably be a timely topic for now. Um, and I think it's worth talking specifically about our mental health, um, particularly anxiety and depression being sort of the most common uh, mental health conditions that we face. So we talk on this show a lot about emotional health, but we really kind of only scratched the surface on mental health. Um, so can you first just speak to how these two terms are related, but also different? Sure. When I think about emotional health, I think of that as the ability to cope with and manage emotions. Um, it's also the ability to have positive relationships. So the relational part of it and the emotions and the coping and managing with emotions. Mental health is the ability to think clearly and make good decisions. It's also the ability to, to cope with stress and then obviously to manage emotions. And that's the back connection to emotional health. We know that emotions and thoughts are clearly connected and they're powered primarily by our brains. And so they also feed into one another and what we think influences how we feel and vice versa. So roughly how many people would you say are currently experiencing some sort of mental illness or a mental health condition? So um, I looked up uh, just to make sure I had the correct statistics on this. And the National Institute on Mental Health estimates that one in five Americans suffer from mental illness. And that's from 2020. And that's about 50. That was about 53 million people that year. And I'm sure when we look at those statistics, when they come out for 21 and 22, we're either going to see an increase because of the pandemic. Yeah, I recently saw I had seen a study where it was like, I think anxiety was up roughly like 37% since the start of the pandemic and depression was up like 27% since the start yeah. of the pandemic. So um, we can see that trending upwards. I think it was trending upward prior to um, the pandemic and that really just exacerbated it. Um, so if we're looking at, at trends over the next couple of years, obviously the pandemic's still lingering. Some of the other things that we're dealing with are still lingering. Um, and there's, we're, you know, piling new things on like um, I saw an article today about um, like climate change, anxiety and those types of things. Um, that are now popping up as well. So I think a trend is we're going to see this not really going away necessarily, um, especially as we get more comfortable talking about it and that sort of thing too, which is um, something we'll dig in, I think, later in the episode as well. But um, over the course of a you know someone's lifetime, um, about how many people experience a mental health condition at, at some point? Um, the statistics say it's about 46% or about half the people will experience some kind of mental illness during their lifetime. And just a few other statistics I thought was interesting when I was thinking about this was 5% of adults 18 or older will experience mental illness in any one year. Of, of adults in the United States with a mental disorder in a one year period, um, there's almost 15% will have one disorder, but then there are like anywhere from six to 8%, uh, will have three or more disorders like anxiety and depression, anxiety, depression, substance use. So these are not things that happen in, you know, a vacuum or on just one off. They continue, they tend to, to exasperate and build on each other. Yeah. That's pretty staggering to think that like basically half of people um, will experience it at some point And we still have this stigma <laughs> of like talking about it and understanding it and seeking help and all those types of things. And even just the way that we see it portrayed in the media, um, a lot of times it's, it's just interesting that like it impacts us so deeply, um, yet we still have a hard time talking about it. Um, so that's one of the goals of this conversation is to really kind of break that down a little bit. But how many of that, like, you know, 46% of people actually go on to seek some sort of professional help? Only about, and actually less than half of them, it's about 41% will actually go and seek professional health care for a mental health disorder, mental illness, which I think is, you know, also staggering. You think about that means that there are at least more than half of the folks who are struggling are not seeking help or not getting the health care that they need for that. Um, men and women, when you look at men and women differences, females are more than more likely to go and receive mental health services than men are. Um, and 
uh, young adults um, are less likely than older adults to receive mental health care. And I think that's part of that whole uh, young adult learning to what it means to be an adult, learning what it means to do to, to practice self-care, because we are more likely to start going to the doctor more routinely, paying attention to our health in general more routinely. The older we get, probably also related to employment, consistent employment and access to health care. So as we age, we tend to be more likely to seek out services. So younger adults are less likely than older adults to seek services. That's really interesting. I would have guessed that it would have been the other way around, um, that younger adults would have been more likely because they seem to be the ones that are a little bit more open in talking about it. And it, um, it's kind of one of their uh, mantles that they've taken up, it seems like. Um, so it's interesting that they're they're less likely. I wonder if that's that switch is coming relatively soon as they start to get just a little bit older and end up in the, the workforce and um, have more access and those types of things. And again, the stigma continues to come down. Um, I have a feeling we'll start to see that switch then relatively soon, hopefully sooner rather than later. I, w I would also um, theorize that it's a so it's the social aspect that younger adults have more of a social peer group place to talk about it place where it's like you said it's safer for them to talk about it with their peers and the people around them it's less likely to be stigmatized for them to ask for help um, and so they may not actually need to um, help seek with professionals because they're receiving that from their social supports yeah. which is something that as we age some of us have fewer and fewer of them I wonder if it's like the ubiquitousness of like, you know, apps and things like that, too, that are focused on this, you know, your head spaces and um, or even the like the students at UK now have access to talk space for free, like those types of things. I'm imagining that gets classified as um, seeking professional help because they're actually connecting with someone. Right. Um, but I wonder if like some of those, you know, supportive apps, um, like the meditative apps and those types of things. Um, I wonder if those are contributing to maybe staving off um, the need for professional help to a certain degree. Yeah. And podcasts and, um, you know, Google is our friend these days. So we can find almost any information on the internet. Now, what the quality of that information is, is going to be really, you know, defendable, but we are able to actually seek information on our own without actually going to someone and finding out what's really going on with us. And then we know whether or not to seek help. So I think that some of that is just, they're ruling themselves out as much as in to services. Yeah. I think I actually want to dive into that here in just a few minutes as well, but I kind of mentioned it already that basically the most common mental health conditions that everyone, you know, sort of knows, um, but we also experience most frequently are anxiety and depression. But it's kind of important to note that these are different from feeling anxious or, you know, feeling down because they do sort of have that, you know, clinical definition to them as well. So how would you define each of these and, and then differentiate them from the feelings that they're connected to? Well, let's start with anxiety. So anxiety is a normal response to stress. It isn't always a bad thing. It usually goes away after that stressor is over. But when it gets to be an uncontrollable or excessive or to the point where it affects your quality of life, that's when you're starting to think maybe this is an anxiety disorder. And then the pr most common anxiety disorder is generalized anxiety disorder. And it can look a lot like regular anxiety at first, but it's characteristic by an unrealistic or excessive worry about about everything, even things you might not even be able to name. Some folks are actually will talk about, I'm just worried all the time. And then we'll say, well, what are you worried about? What thoughts are kind of driving that worry? And they can, they'll even say, I'm not even sure. I just feel worried. And so that's kind of like unrealistic, excessive worry thing. And then the actual clinical um, uh, diagnosis requires it to be at least six months and then to get in the way of your daily functioning. Yeah, so I hear things like affecting that quality of life really um, is what kind of takes it to another level because it's not it goes beyond that short term like maybe it affects you for a couple of days at a time um, versus like the clinical definition of being beyond six months. I think that's an important sort of distinction. Well, I mean, worry and anxiety are normal reactions to things that are stressful, and they can be even like you know, stress is not a bad thing. Stress it can be the um, you know, stress can be bad, but there's also use stress, which is that 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 excitement, that challenge, and so we may be worried about 
about a test that's coming up or worried about a job interview. And although those are stressful, they are also considered good stressful, right? Because they have hope for the future. They're about something that we're excited about, a challenge. And so that can be all that kind of worry is not something that that's something everybody will feel. But it really does become that whole about worrying to an excessive amount, unable to let it go kind of thing. Yeah. What about depression? So um, sadness is a normal emotion. Every single person experiences that. And, and, you know, we have stressful times. We have times that are more somber than others. It's often triggered by that feeling of loss, whether it's grief or when we lose someone we love, ending a relationship, loss of a job or feeling disappointed when something doesn't work out. Um, we tend to relieve those ourselves by crying or venting. We talk about that. We talk about our frustrations um, and it can usually lessen over time. And so, you know, it's not something that stays with us. It's a, it's an, it, it can, it tends to be alleviated by our normal responses to sadness. Um, but experiencing sadness um, longer than that, or if it doesn't pass and we're unable to resume our normal function, this could be when you start thinking about signs of depression. And when you think about depression and when someone experiences sadness nearly every day for two weeks, this is a sign that it might be time to seek help. Yeah, it's interesting, too, that the like time frames on those are different. Because you could experience like anxiety for maybe two weeks um, and it still be considered sort of a, a short term thing. Um, whereas depression, if you go over two weeks, um, it may actually start, you know, dipping into that clinical classification. So how are these two connected or related to each other? So they're very much interrelated um, and they often tend to be co-occurring and almost cyclical. So, for example, when you get anxious, you have the tendency to have this pervasive thinking about um, some worry or some problem. Then you start feeling bad about it. Then you feel like you failed. You move on to feeling depressed. People living with depression are often often feel anxious and worried and one can easily trigger the other. But anxiety tends to come before depression for most people. Um, so the chance of acquiring depression is much higher when an anxiety disorder already exists. So if you think about that, that drawing that, um, the anxiety can lead to this sense of hopelessness, helplessness, feeling like th that sense of dread, and that can lead into that feeling like there's no, there's no point for the future and that sadness and that overwhelming feelings of almost like grief can occur. Yeah. There does seem to be um, a tendency for folks with PTSD to be more prone for depression. And there's also tends to be a genetic predisposition for both disorders. That's more obvious with anxiety because some people are just worriers and then they pass it on to their kids. Um, I always talk about, you know, my my family is uh, kind of runs on anxiety. We are high function anxiety people. We just run on it and we feed on each other. But and I, you know, I don't know that we've had any like major trauma. It's just that that is how we've re we've um, been socialized and we have a predisposition to run on that whole sense of what are we worried about today and what's going to happen tomorrow and what can I do to plan for for it. So, um, so I do think there is definitely a genetic predisposition for both disorders though. What about other factors? Are there any other factors that would, you know, put someone at potentially higher risk for experiencing either or both? Um, sure. So for, for anxiety, trauma is definitely a higher risk for anxiety disorders is trauma, particularly children who've endured or abuse or trauma or witnessed traumatic events. They're at higher risk for developing an, an anxiety disorder at some point in life. Um, we think that's related to the fact that they were, because of the trauma they experienced, their amygdala, that part of their brain, that spite, flight, freeze, that primitive part that tells them when there's danger, it tends to get stuck on. And so their relationship to the world is always what is going to come, what's going to, what bear is going to eat me right now. You know, they're, they're, everything looks like a danger coming towards them. Um, it can also be due to illness, stress buildup over time, like chronic stress, like multiple stressful experiences that happen over time. Again, about that personality piece, sometimes it's just part of who our makeup and who we are. Um, having other mental health disorders, personality disorders, um, you know, cognitive uh, limitations, some of those things can lead to more anxiety. Um, and then drugs or alcohol use can also increase your risk for anxiety disorders. Um, 
I can also talk a little bit about depression. Yeah, sure. For people with depression, they tend to, um, the risk for depression tends to be low self-esteem, negative outlook on life or more at risk. And also there are risk factors for populations. So women are more at risk for depression. Adults age 45 to 65 are more at risk. We found that race is a factor with people, uh, uh, people in the white population have a more likelihood to have depression, that there's greater um, incidence of depression with white folks, but our um, uh, black and Hispanic populations, they experience uh, depression at greater severity. So they're, they don't have as great of numbers of depression, but they have greater severity when they are depressed. And then there's some just basic socioeconomic um, things that go, that go with depression. And that includes uh, living at or near poverty, uh, limited education, uh, just that whole, about, uh, it's about security. When you think about Maslow's hierarchy and needs and those basic needs being met, food, clothing, shelter, sense of security, those first couple levels. When you d or live in poverty, you t at or near poverty, it's always about how are you going to pay this bill? How are you going to put food on your table? And those things can lead to depression. Um, and then there's also um, a connection with depression and sleep disorders and also certain types of medication, particularly those who, uh, for pain, pain medications tend to exasperate depression. Yeah, the sleep one's interesting to me because it's like it can cause it, but it could also exacerbate it too. So it, it sort of kind of shows you the importance of sleep um, or any of the other factors that you at least have some control over, but you named quite a few that you have limited or no control over as well. So um, there's a lot of different factors that can go into this. So it's really kind of important to, to know that, but it doesn't mean that you're necessarily to get it just because you have one or more of these factors present in your life. Um, but it is at least kind of good to be aware of, um, and it's good to kind of understand where those might be or what those might be, um, which leads us to kind of what the signs and symptoms of each are as well. Um, so there are so many really good little like uh, screeners that you can do online today if you want to know if you meet the criteria for a generalized anxiety disorder or a depression disorder. For um, And so I just wanted to share those. So there's something called the GAD-7, which is general anxiety disorder and then seven, which is the seven criteria that if you GAD slash seven, you can Google that and it'll come up for you. And then there's a PHQ nine, which is will ask you the depression symptoms. And um, so, but the space specific symptoms of a generalized anxiety disorder are feeling restless, wound up or on edge, easily fatigued, difficulty concentrating, feeling like irritable all the time. Um, some folks have somatic symptoms like headaches, muscle aches, stomach aches, or just unexplained aches or pains. They have difficult controlling their worrying, which is what we've talked a lot about, or they worry too much about different things. They may feel fear or dread, like something awful is going to happen. And then again, that sleep problems, which is very um correlated for both depression and anxiety. Like you said, sleep is such a huge part of how we interact with our world, how we're able to tolerate stress. And so not sleeping or not sleeping initially can exasperate our depression and anxiety symptoms, but it can also lead us to sleep too much because it's a, one of our ways to get away from those feelings of depression, and anxiety, and it's one of the ways we withdraw and isolate. So too much sleep can be just as bad as not enough sleep for both of these, um, these disorders. So for depression, you're looking for things like feeling down, depressed, and hopeless, persistently sad, little interest or pleasure in doing things you usually enjoy. Some folks will talk about feel, feeling self-loathing. They, you know, like they feel like a failure. They feel like they failed everyone in their life. Again, sleep problems. Um, depression, um, folks will often talk about just feeling tired or no energy and just, or just kind of like their body just feels like they can't really move. Like there's almost like, um, one, one client once told me it was like, she's like, she swam through jello all day mm -hmm. long. Like her whole body just felt like it was just too tired to move. Um, poor appetite and overeating is also um, common and then trouble concentrating and then thoughts you'd be better off dead or hurting yourself in some way is also one of the um, more severe and more concerning symptoms of depression. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm hearing physical and mental or emotional manifestations as well, um, which is, again, it's sort of covering that full spectrum of your well-being. But something else that's interesting to me with these two is, is sort of, again, sort of that portrayal of them and what they sort of look like. Um, there's an idea around silent sufferers that I think is really interesting. So could you speak to that maybe a little bit? Well, I think that we... There is a tendency for us in our society to not talk about our mental health because there is so much stigma related with it. And so it's seen as a character flaw or a defect for some to have these issues, to not be able to handle their problems, to not stop worrying, to not manage, you know, their motivation and like not to be able to, you know, meet their obligations. Because what happens with both anxiety and depression is when it starts impacting your daily life. Life or your ability to meet their your responsibilities. It impacts your relationships, impacts your ability to be a good employee, it impacts your ability to take care of your home and your kids, your family, or even to walk your dog. It can impact all of those kind of responsibilities in our life. And so when we um, are told that those are not something that's normal, it's we don't normalize it as a mental health disorder or an, a, another physical health disorder like depression anxiety, diabetes, when we stop at thinking of these things as chronic illnesses that can be treated and we start thinking them as something that's a failure within ourselves, we're less likely to seek help or talk about it. And so we tend to wait until it's really bad before we seek help. Yeah. And I think you kind of alluded to it earlier with like being high functioning and like, it's sort of just the way that you operate and people don't really necessarily recognize that that could be something you're going through. Cause it's not like, Hey, I like an Ill, a traditional illness. Like, Hey, I've got a cold and I've got the sniffles right. clearly, clearly something's going on or, Hey, I broke my arm. I got it in a, in a sling or whatever. Um, it's, it's outward and seen, um, but depending on how you talk about it, um, or how you choose to talk about it, um, it may or may not go seen by someone else. So I think that's sort of the idea behind like silent sufferers is that like, a lot of people, and I mean, we've talked about it, almost 50% of people are affected by it at some point. But part of that stigma, I think, you know, like you said, is like, we don't talk about it. So we don't see it as often, or we don't know that it's occurring as much as it actually is occurring. Um, and so we we can suffer in silence, um, because maybe somebody doesn't recognize some of those signs and that sort of thing, too. I think another thing that could be kind of contributing to this factor, too, is that like media portrayals, like particularly, you know, like movies and that sort of thing, tend to have those like extreme depictions. Um, so I'm thinking of like basically any Batman villain, like, you know, the Joker, for example, um, or, you know, Ken Kesey's One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, um, something like that, where it's like a really extreme case um, rather than being, you know, something that's more normalizing to the process or like what people also experience somewhere in that middle um, with, you know, a show like um, Never Have I Ever, which is on Netflix, is a fairly recent show uh, that I think was run by Mindy Kaling from The Office. Um, like that one is it did a really good job of sort of normalizing what it's like um, to to seek help and what um, certain disorders may you know manifest um, internally or externally. So um, I think that that's part of the problem. But um, I think we've also seen some other positives too recently, though, which is good. This is where I think some of the conversation is shifting because um, we've seen like at the Olympics with Simone Biles and people like that, um, or Michael Phelps, um, people who have been very open in discussing the struggles that they've had, um, or musicians like Demi Lovato who have who have been very open about um, the struggles that they've had with you know mental health, um, whichever disorder that um, or condition that they may be facing. So. Um, hopefully, again, that's sort of helping change that narrative. But we've traditionally seen um, in books and movies and TV and um, that sort of thing where it's been these really big extreme examples. And they're like, oh, well, that's not me. I'm not like Jack Nicholson um, breaking down a door right now or something. Yeah. I also think we have this tendency to compare ourselves to others. And so if I'm not as bad off as somebody else, then maybe this is not really a problem. And we forget that our problems are still our problems, no matter, you know, if their symptoms may look worse because of the way they report them, but our symptoms are just as difficult or just as struggling. And so it's okay to ask for help, even if you don't think you meet that level of other folks who might be seeking help around you. Yeah. And I think this kind of takes us into the next part of our conversation here, which is like, I feel like a challenge of this is really recognizing when you're specifically experiencing uh, or potentially experiencing a mental health condition and then 
from there, like when, if, or how to even seek support. So first, how do we recognize that we might be experiencing anxiety or depression, especially when they are getting conflated with um, those general feelings of, you know, anxiousness or um, feeling down or blue or something like that? Well, I think uh, we've talked a lot already about um, the fact that the stigma is being lowered and that we are much more likely to be talking about it and to have better depictions of it in, in media as far as what a mental, illness, mental disorder or mental um, health issue looks like. So I'm hoping that we're embracing mental health wellness and prevention as well as mental illness. And so, you know, it's if it's ideal to go to the doctor for a checkup once a year, and then it should be begin hopefully to be more ideal to occasionally check in with someone about your mental health. Um, but when you really want to make sure you get help would be um, for depression. Again, it becomes a concern when it occurs nearly every day for two weeks. And it really is those two pieces that I talked about um, when I was talking about the symptoms. The first two gate qu questions that you want to ask yourself is, have I felt down, depressed and hopeless for nearly every day for the last two weeks? And I've had little interest or pleasure and things I usually enjoy for the last two weeks. So that's, you know, that's that's more than just feeling sad. And it's more than um, chron uh, like like acute grief after the loss of someone. Of course, if you someone you love dies, you're going to feel that way for two weeks or more. But this is more about that whole ability not to have any alleviation from that. In normal grief cycles, we tend to like have um, different responses throughout the day. And so, you know, sometimes we feel grateful and relieved because someone's suffering is over. And then we, that whole, that feeling of loss and hopelessness and not feeling connected to them anymore. Those can happen in the same day, but that's not what we're talking about here. This is like truly feeling down, depressed and hopeless almost nearly every day for two weeks. So that would be depression with anxiety disorders. Um, again, it's that worry and anxiousness that persists like constantly worrying, not able to control the worrying, finding that you you know, your brain cannot stay on focus because you're worried about something. Uh, uh, I find that anxiety tends to follow two kind of paths and they flip flop between the two. And that's that whole ruminating worrying. You worry about everything that's ever happened to you. Did you say the right thing in that conversation? You have that visceral gut reaction to that horrible, embarrassing thing that happened to you in seventh grade, even though it's been 30 years ago, you just keep going back to the past. And then that's one thing that I call forecasting, which is that dread about the future. Like you can't, you, you want to plan everything. You're afraid it's not going to work out. You're, you're concerned about your safety, your children's safety, the safety of the world, climate change, whatever it is, you can't seem to let that go and that persists for six months, that's when it becomes an issue. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. The secondary piece to that challenge is really like once you've come to that realization, um, whether you did say the GAD7 or the PHQ9 or something like that, um, and you're like, hey, I might need to seek help on this. Actually going and seeking help is another, you know, kind of step or another layer to that challenge. Um, and again, there's there's a multitude of reasons why you may or may not follow through with that. Um, some of those, again, sort of might potentially be out of your control when they're related to, you know, financials or access or something like that, um, which are things that we need to work on as a society. Um, but then you also have sort of that individual follow through if you do have all the other things that are lined up for you um, and available, just actually getting, you know, proverbially out the door and going and doing it. So, uh, what would you say to someone who is considering seeking help but hasn't quite made it up that hill yet? So I think any time is a good time to seek help. I think that, again, going back to the idea, like if you're, you know, even if you're just struggling with a decision and it's not like worrying about it every day, but you're really feeling indecisive about it and you just want to talk it out that's a good time to seek help. Or if you're finding that your grief response feels too big for you and that you just need to talk about your losses, that's a good time to seek help. It doesn't have to be until when you meet the diagnostic criteria for a mental health disorder to seek help. But I will say if your sadness or worry persists and it impacts your motivation and your ability to meet your daily responsibilities at home or work or in relationships, if, you're, if your motivation is really suffering, then it's time to talk to someone. 
Yeah, I mean, I kind of hear almost a message of prevention in that as well, that like you don't necessarily have to reach a certain threshold to, you know, seek help and have a conversation with a therapist um, or some other avenue um, that would be, you know, kind of in that field. And maybe you can provide some other examples of what that might look like. But um, but yeah, I mean, for our listeners who are employees, retirees or spouses of the university, what can they expect from, you know, visiting with Anne, Rhonda, you or Eric? Especially the first time, maybe I should say. Right. Okay, the first time. Um, I think what you will find is that we want to hear what's going on with you, and we just want to listen and understand what what you're feeling. And I think that one of the things I always really stress with my new clients is that these are your five sessions. They are part of your benefits package. You can use those for any, you know, if you just want to come and talk about why the Steelers continuously losing <laughs> is constantly making you worried about the future of football, come talk to me. I'm your person for that one. But if, you know, it doesn't have to be like some kind of big catastrophic issue. It just means, you know, you just don't want to talk to somebody. You want to work something out. Maybe you're struggling with a coworker and communication and relational issues. Maybe, you know, you're, you're struggling with, you know, bonding with your child or you've had a loss or something that you just want someone to talk to about. Those are reasons to come to see us. We'll also work with you if you do feel like you may have an anxiety disorder or, um, you know, depression or any of the other disorders. We'll help you to like determine and tease that out and then figure out what a good treatment plan for that would be, whether it's to use all five of our sessions, whether it's to go to long-term therapy, we're a great place to start with that. Um, a great gateway into therapy per se, because we really are here to just listen and find out and see how we can be most useful to you. And I mentioned access as being part of the equation and, and you know, accessing uh, mental health care in some form. Um, I know there's been there's been kind of a narrative and there were at times there were definitely challenges, especially in the throes of the pandemic. And um, once we went down um, a therapist and those types of things, there were some issues with getting in in a, in a more timely manner. That was something we saw across the nation, um, but something that we obviously knew was an area that we could continue to work on and focus on. So what does that look like right now? Um, if somebody's listening right now and they want to you know, sign up for an appointment. Um, what does that you know, process or timeline look like for them at this moment? Well, um, I, we're about about two, three weeks out, but I will say that if you feel like it's a crisis and you need to talk to someone more quickly, um, you're welcome to contact one of us and we can work with our team to see if there's someone who can see you a little bit more quickly than that. But about two to three weeks out is generally what the wait list is to see us when we offer telehealth and we are now back in person as of about a month ago. So that's been a kind of a transition for us. But um, so we are offering at least, um, you know, every day. Day, there are some in-person appointments available and there are all, and telehealth is also still an option, which for a lot of our employees is really convenient, particularly our employees who are not campus based yeah. or not Lexington based. That's been a real um, a benefit for them to be able to access our services more equitably. Yeah. And I think that's actually something that probably contributed a little bit to the backup there for a while is that suddenly because of the way that we had to move, um, access actually opened up for a lot of people who had less access to it previously. So in a way, it was actually a positive, but obviously, you know, like keeping um, those wait times down is is definitely a positive for us. And we want to keep it that way. Um, but obviously, being able to help everyone, too, is is huge um, for us. And to reiterate, too, it's five per year um, and those are free. Um, so just making sure that our University of Kentucky employees, retirees and spouses know that they have access to it. So each employee gets five per year um, and you can divvy those up between um, your spouse um, or your children as well. Um, so I think that's something that's not always commonly known to um, So I know a couple of you all work in that realm as well um, and have had a background with working with children, too. Um, and then, as you mentioned, you know, referring out um, if you, you know, need more help beyond that, um, you all are great at connecting into um, either campus resources or university healthcare um, resources or, you know, community partners or anything like that too. Yeah. And I think we alleviate that wait waiting list for a longer term therapist. Like um, employees can you utilize our services while they're on the waiting list to see somebody and to get established with a long term therapist and work with us on like coping skills and self-care and things that will benefit them as they start that longer term work with a therapist. Yeah, that's good to know too. 
So I'd like to focus on the workplace specifically, since we're kind of talking about a, a workplace specific resource as well. Um, I'd like to talk about that a little bit for the final part of our conversation. So what tips do you have for managing anxiety and or depression in the workplace or now, I guess I should say, um, throughout the work day, since we're all working in very different locations and um, not as traditional as we used to be? Um, well, I think it all starts with self-care. And one of the things that um, I always kind of stress with all of my clients is the concept of HALT, which is hungry, angry, lonely, tired, HALT. So when we get to HALT, we need to take a step back and figure out which one of those might be contributing to our stress or our emotions at that moment in time. So, you know, and this hungry is not just, it's obviously eating because when we haven't eaten, we tend to be more irritable and less responsive and we lack more motivation. And sometimes just stopping and eating something and then redirecting our, our our energy back to the whatever is in front of us will be you know will be much more successful that way but it's also just fueling your body and it's and it's about daily practice of good appetite good eating um, angry is emotional regulation not sitting on emotions not waiting until you're so angry that you want to quit before you talk to your supervisor about something uh, lonely is that connectiveness and I think that it's not just like um, so maybe sometimes our coworkers and, and um, we, we all want to believe our coworkers are doing the best they can I believe that 100% but sometimes they're not necessarily the people that we feel the most connected to and so we need to make sure that outside of work we're feeling that connectedness that we are getting that um, like good hugs at home physical phys you know a 20 second hug a day actually uh, causes a parasympathetic response in our body and calms us down. But also, if you do feel like you're close to your coworkers, ask for a hug when you need it. Um, and then uh, um, tired is, you know, sleep. You know, when we're doing those things, sleep, tired, tiredness, and then also thirst, drinking plenty of water. Those are things that we can do every day just trying to make our window of tolerance, our capacity for tolerance for stress a little bit higher. And so that when stressful events do occur, we have that a little more vulnerability to those issues. I think that's a good mindfulness and practice activity to do as well as a chance to slow down and check in with yourself and um, assess, is it one of these, at least is it one of these four things? Um, and if it is, then you can address those in the moment um, and use that as an opportunity for a break as well. Um, so like you said, so that you can refocus at the task at hand. Um, so that's a, that's a really good one. That's one I, I enjoy. Um, and it's funny you brought up the 20 second hug. I think that came up in a previous episode, um, but I actually just gave a, a best man speech at a wedding um, a few weeks ago. And I actually mentioned the 20 second hug <laughs> as one of the things, <laughs> as like one of my pieces of advice. Um, so it's funny that that came up here. I definitely did not prompt you for that one. <laughs> That's okay. But um, was it because somebody's love language was physical touch? Is that why you recommended that? No, I was just, yeah, I was just, I was just rattling off a few things. I was like, here's my chance for unsolicited advice. So I'm going to give it to people because, um, hey, I didn't know if anybody else in the, in the crowd wanted to hear it too. So I was trying to work it as best as I could, but um, yeah, I knew that was one that was one that and during the pandemic actually worked out really um, well for me and something my wife and I started doing mm -hmm. um, and have tried to continue doing as often as possible um, that I thought was a really impactful thing to do. So um, I just like to share it with people when I get the chance. But yeah, I guess if uh, if physical touch isn't part of your love language, it probably, <laughs> probably doesn't work out as well for you. But well, it, it does. If you if the other person you're in a relationship, if that is their love language, it's important to meet that need. Right. And so like I, you know, we do, we have we have our 20 second hug every day, too. I just think that's really important. But I'm not a hugger. I wasn't raised in a hugging family. We tend to fist bump, high five and pat people on the back, you know, and then be like, no obligatory hugging, please. You know, we like have this like force field around us. And so, but my husband loves hugs and he comes from a hugging family. And, you know, I, I was like, okay, this is something he needs from me. And so sometimes I have to count to 20, <laughs> but I give him that hug every single day because it's important to him. And it's my, my way of showing him love. And honestly, it does benefit me too, because I do get that calming effect. I do yeah. get the parasympathetic response that comes from that. So. So we've been kind of building to this as well, which is like, we hear that we should talk more about mental health in the workplace. So I guess, why is it important to even do that? Well, I mean, what we know about 
poor mental health in the workplace is that it makes people miss work. They have more difficulties at work, more difficult interpersonal reactions and interactions with their coworkers, and that tends to cause recidivism. People don't stay because the morale or because they don't feel safe in their work environment. And so just from a from an employer perspective, it benefits us to maintain a healthy work workforce. And so I would think that would be, you know, making a workplace safe, it increases productivity, and it helps you keep great employees. And it's a good thing to do, because it's the right thing to do, too. But, you know, sometimes we need all of the all the Venn diagram of reasons. Yeah. Why. <laughs> yeah, and then you I mean, you kind of mentioned it as well already too, like those those pieces of connection and that sort of thing, that psychological safety and all of that, um, that go into um, just feeling, you know, a sense of belonging, um, and that sort of thing too, it really helps um, with that, especially if you think about the concept of like silent sufferers, those people don't have to suffer um, if you have, a, you know, kind of a more open, um, safe environment to talk about these things, which brings up a good question of how do we actually open that conversation up on mental health in the workplace and, you know, create a safe, accepting and supportive culture? Well, I think you have to have a culture of wellness where self-care is valued. And I think that's something that I, I personally, as a UK employee, think that UK does a really nice job of. Um, not only, you know, I, I, I've only now come to be part of the wellness team, but I've been a, a UK employee for um, um, 22 years now. And so in my previous job where we were working with low income families, our staff were, you know, frontline um, mental health professionals. They were constantly you know, being, um, you know, bearing witness to other people's struggles and their suffering. They were constantly on as far as being there for crises. So what we did um, is we actually added self-care as a major job responsibility. Mm -hmm. Like we said, not only do we value this, but we anticipate and expect you to do good self-care. And so UK actually backed that up. And since many ways, like we now have two mental health care days that we can take a, a, a year, um, you know, we're encouraged to use our wellness programs and to take care of ourselves. So I think that, you know, making that a normal expectation, like being on work on time, you take care of yourself. Those are things that we can do to make that more um, uh, uh, acceptable and more likely for our employees to feel like they can take care of an advantage of those things. And then the last question related to that, how do we sort of safely navigate these kinds of conversations as maybe like a coworker, a supervisor who may be experiencing anxiety or depression? Well, first, I think you know your rights. Be prepared to ask for what you need. Um, and maybe it's just to make them aware so that if you have a flare up or if you have a concern or that maybe you're having a couple of bad days, that they understand when you might need to ask to take a step back from a project or you might need to be time to have time off so they'll be prepared for that. Or it could be allowing you to do parts of your job in a different way. Here at UK, you can consult with Heather Roop, who's the ADA coordinator, who can help you determine if you qualify for reasonable accommodations and you can navigate those conversations with your coworkers and your supervisors. So sometimes it's just about saying, hey, I'm having I'm struggling right now. You know, I'm having some, you know, some symptoms of anxiety and depression. You know, I'm, I'm seeking services for that. I just want you to know I might feel seem a little less motivated or seem a little more withdrawn right now. But I am I, I don't need anything from you, but I just want to make you aware of that in case you're seeing something. And please, you know, feel free to talk to me about it if you're concerned about it or it could be hey I have these symptoms and I'm really struggling right now with being in large groups so can I do small group projects for a while so those are two different ways of kind of thinking about approaching that but really knowing your rights and being kind of clear about what it is you need because I think most supervisors want to be helpful to their employees but they don't always know how to be and so if you ask them for certain things and it's reasonable, you know, I think that you're going to find people who are very open to, to supporting you. And then if it's a specific accommodation, there are legal and uh, ways to go about that. And I think that that's where Heather can come in as the ADA coordinator. And to not put the onus on, you know, the person who may be experiencing, you know, anxiety or depression, let's flip the script a little bit too. And like, what if you're, you're the supervisor or the employee that is not experiencing it um, and you want to be supportive in some way, how do you, how do you be more supportive or navigate those types of conversations? So I think there's a couple different scenarios there. If you notice that someone's 
starting to so show signs of you know depression or anxiety they seem more irritable they um, start to avoid certain projects or activities if they're not being as timely you know you, you you address as a supervisor you address the behaviors but then you ask about you know are you know here's what i'm seeing tell me what if there's anything going on is how can i assist you with meeting this obligation for your job i mean i think you have a really nice behavioral supportive con um conversation with them about that because as a supervisor it's your responsibility to not only you know care for them but also to make sure that the job is getting done and so that can open up when asked people are more likely to talk about what's going on with them when you ask them what's going on with them so that would be the first thing and the second thing is to say it sounds like you're really struggling right now. I mean, I, I, as, I mean, I was a supervisor in my last job. And so, you know, it could have been something like, um, you know, they need family medical leave and they need to take off a couple of weeks to start therapy and to get their medications managed, you know, so making sure that they know what their rights are and what, who to contact at UK to get that set up. Cause as supervisors, we should not be making reasonable accommodations or we, and we cannot um, provide, you know, medical leave, but what we can do is is tell them that that is an opportunity for them and make sure they're talking to the right people to get that set up. Um, and then, you know, when we feel like they do need reasonable accommodations, we tell them who to talk to so that that's all above board and that it's part of, you know, an expectation and their rights as an employee that they're getting their needs met. Yeah. And I think, I mean, what I'm hearing too is like the uh, really just using curiosity to provide an opportunity for that person to open up if they feel comfortable Absolutely. and that keeps it from being a, you know, a conversation that's like prying or pressuring as well. Right. And, you know, and honoring the fact that they may not want to talk about what's going on with them. And then you focus on helping them to get their job done and to, and holding them to that. And because it's ultimately, ultimately in the day, that's your job, but you know, making that like, I love the way, way you use the word curiosity, but just like opening the conversation up, but also acknowledging the fact that they do not have to tell you what's going on with them. That's not a requirement yeah. for us to disclose our health our health issues at work, physical or mental health issues. But if it is impacting our work, then it is important as a supervisor to make sure that the employee knows what resources are available to them. Um, you know, even if it's just to say, you know, there's work-life connections therapists. Have you thought about just chatting with them, talking to them about what's going on and seeing if that's something they can help with? You know, it doesn't have to be naming a specific disorder or, you know, or, or pointing out specific issues. It could just be as simple as offering help and resources on campus. Yep. So on the topic of resources, do you have any that you tend to recommend to people to dive deeper into, um, you know, mental health or anxiety or depression? You've already mentioned the GAD7 and the PHQ-9. Um, do you have any other like books or, you know, podcasts or anything like that that you recommend to people? There's several podcasts on anxiety, like The Anxious Mind and a few others. Um, I would say that you could do just a, a really good, actually, you can just Google anxiety podcasts and you'll get a nice list of them. So again, I'm, I am such a big proponent of Google, even with research with my, my students. But, you know, I, you know, I just think that it's important to know just to be a good explorer, a good internet explorer person and just getting in there and finding out what's available to you. But two websites that I think are the most, uh, quality that you can find information um, quickly and will lead you to other resources is the Substance Use and Mental Health Services Administration or SAMHSA, which is the federal website for anything that has to do with substance use and mental health in the United States. All sorts of great information for both uh, uh, individuals seeking services, but also for helping professionals. Um, and then um, one of the most common ones and one I think that a lot of people find is a good resource and easily accessible is the NAMI website, which is the National Association of Mental Illness. They have so many good supports and resources on that website, including support groups, and some of them are virtual. So, you know, you can start that, that help seeking um, journey from your computer in a more safe environment by starting out in a support group where you feel like you find people who can universalize and understand what's going on with you. Cause that, I think that's one of the hardest things is feeling alone when you have a mental illness. I don't always toss in recommendations during this portion. I usually leave it to you all, but I've actually got one that I've found um, really helpful, um, which was unwinding anxiety by Dr. Judson Brewer. That was a really good book. 
um, that I thought was really helpful in, in basically helping us recognize our habit loops um, using curiosity and mm-hmm. then how we can kind of basically break those habit loops um, around things like anxiety. Um, but they also used it for things like smoking um, and eating disorders as well. But really just using our brain's internal reward system to kind of hack um, those habit loops that we find ourselves getting stuck in. Um, so I thought that was a really great resource. There's actually an app related to that as well. Um, I think it's a pay service, um, but the book has a lot of that information as well. Um, and I think is well worth a read if you get a chance. Um, and then I'll throw a podcast in there as well. The Anxious Achiever um, is very much kind of like the, the workplace orientation to um, anxiety. Um, so it's well worth a listen as well. But um, at this point in the conversation, we also um, give you the opportunity to add on to our Wildly Resilient playlist, um, which is now on Spotify, Apple Music, and YouTube. So what song would you add that brings about a sense of resilience in your life? Okay, so I will say that I did a Brene Brown course where we were supposed to come up with our theme song, and it it was it turned out to be about twelve of them. So I have two. I, I narrowed it down to two. <laughs> <laughs> They're both Mary Chapin Carpenter songs, and the first one is "The Bug." And I love that song because it just talks about sometimes you're the windshield and sometimes you're the bug. Sometimes it all comes together, baby. And sometimes you're just a fool in love. I like the whole idea that sometimes you're, it's going to be bad and sometimes it's going to be good. But you know, the ideal is just, you're never, none of us are going to get out of this. So you might as well enjoy the ride kind of thing. So I love that song. And then the second one is also a Mary Chapin Car- Carpenter and it's, I take my chances. So, and I think that's a great, like get yourself going and, you know, I, I'm not going to let you tell me how I'm going to live my life. This is who I am. And I'm just going to take my chances and do the best I can going along. So that's fun. You've already thought about that ahead of time too. <laughs> I'm sorry to make you have to narrow it down. I know how hard it was for me to get it down to five songs originally. Um, so I've been cheating all along um, and I've been adding in songs every once in a while. So I've actually got another one for this one too, um, based on our conversation as well, um, which is the song Anxiety by Jason Isbell in the 400 unit. Oh, yeah. um, one of the great like songwriters of current time right now. Um, and that's a really good song about sort of his experience with anxiety. And so um, if you don't really understand what that looks like, that's a great song to listen to if you want to kind of, you know, sort of visualize and hear it in a musical format as well. So what's like the last word, the one thing that you hope listeners take away from this conversation? Well, I think that good mental and emotional health is as important as physical health. And we need to learn to ask for help when we need it and that to remember you're not alone and that treatment works. And I think that has been the probably the most important thing I would say is that seeking help treatment works. There's a reason why it works and just just show up, just show up for treatment and we will see what we can do for you. Well, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge on mental health and anxiety and depression and um, giving those, you know, supportive messages and and again, sort of putting a face on this and us understanding um, how many people are actually experiencing these types of conditions um, so that we can continue to do our part to break down that stigma in the workplace. So again, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. That'll do it for this month's episode. Our discussion was meant to open up the conversation on anxiety and depression by providing a general overview. So I hope that you take from it a better understanding of each condition and feel more comfortable talking about mental health overall. Like most of our topics, there's plenty more to learn. So I also hope you leave with a desire to seek more knowledge on mental health and ways you can contribute to destigmatizing it. Most importantly, I want you to leave this episode knowing where you can find support. To reiterate our conversation, If you or someone you know needs support now, call or text 988, or you can chat online at 988lifeline.org. 988 is a 24-7 national service that connects you with a trained crisis counselor who can help. If you're a University of Kentucky employee, you receive five free and confidential appointments each fiscal year with our mental health therapist. Your spouse or dependents can also take advantage of any of your five appointments. Appointments are available in person, online, and by phone. Employees on a UK health insurance plan also have access to telehealth therapy through Live Health Online. You're automatically enrolled for this benefit, and it's currently a $0 copay. I'll include links to each of these in the show notes. 
There are also some opportunities this fall for UK employees to participate in free QPR suicide prevention and or mental health first aid trainings. If you're a UK healthcare employee, you also now have access to an on-demand QPR suicide prevention training. I'll link to these opportunities in the show notes as well. And on that note, you can check out the show notes to find links to anything else mentioned in the episode, including how you can donate to UK students and employees impacted by the devastating flooding in Eastern Kentucky. I'll also provide a link to the HR calendar where you can browse any additional upcoming work life and well-being events from University of Kentucky Human Resources. Until next time, take care of yourself and others and stay well. Thanks for listening to Becoming Wildly Resilient, a podcast series from University of Kentucky Human Resources, Health and Wellness. The UK HR Health and Wellness team, consisting of certified health coaches, fitness experts, registered dietitians, and wellness specialists, offer a wide range of online and in-person programming to University of Kentucky employees, retirees, and their spouses. If you enjoyed this episode, you can listen and subscribe to future episodes wherever you find your podcasts. Connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram by searching at UKY Wellness. There, you'll find links to episode show notes and more. You can also email health and wellness at uky.edu with any questions or suggestions for future episode topics. To learn more about well-being benefits offered by University of Kentucky Human Resources, visit www.uky.edu/hr/wellbeing. Live well.